Hi guys. Um, this is Isaac again back with a, um, masterclass. This is the Tuesday paper, uh, the multiple, uh, the, um, sorry, data response paper from Tuesday. We'll have Monday up, um, if not later tonight by, uh, over the weekend. Uh, again, once again, as I've done on all of these, apologies for the kind of miscommunication this week. It wasn't clear who'd be doing the recordings. Um, and that's why there was the delay. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Let's get the paper up. So again, as we've been doing, you'll get used to the format by now. We're going to be talking through this kind of the data. You should, you have quite a lot of time for these papers. You should spend about 10, 10 minutes or so really reading the data and trying to work out what's going on there and really understand it. Good tactic is often to kind of read the data first, skim it, read over the first questions, which are going to be the ones that relate to the data. So section A. Um, kind of, uh, sorry. So yeah, you've got. 1A here, A, B, C, D, and E there. So section A, um, is what is really what you, and you want to just read over the data and make sure you understand how it relates to the questions. And then you, once you've read the questions, you can then go back and reread the data with a much more focused eye. In this case, we don't have that much to read, but it's, it's worth picking out a few parts. So basically this is about Vietnam and its inflation. We had DG last time. So another country kind of case study. So in the mid 1980s, Vietnam started the process of moving from a command economy. So that's going to be important. This notion of a command economy, so highlight that, to one in which the market, so this is kind of like the market plays a significant role. So it shifted from a command economy to a market economy. In September 2010, it experienced a sharp rise in inflation. So this is kind of the Vietnam inflation. This was in September 2010. You know the government's target was 8%. You might hi highlight target rate 8%. And then we got these price changes here. We can see in which areas were really important. So let's just have a quick look at this data here. So we can see quite clearly that foodstuffs um, had kind of a quite a high inflation rate, but nothing major. Telecommunications had a negative inflation rate, so deflation. So that's going to be quite crucial there. Maybe we want to say that education was the most expensive kind of area where there was high inflation. But we also have the CPI rating. So what's really important is how in, so the, the way CPI works. And I'll just explain that CPI consumer price index is a kind of way of looking at inflation and what it does is it selects a basket of goods, um, kind of a basket of things you might buy in, in your life and sees how their price is changing over a series of kind of um, over a period of time. However, what it does is it weights certain things more important. For example, you probably spend most of your money that you have if you're Vietnamese on food. So the price of food is obviously going to be more important to you than is the price of telecommunication, for example, which you don't use very often. So despite the fact that telecommunication had a negative inflation rate of 9.59 in 2010, it's kind of deflation. It only is weighted 2.7 percent in CPI, so it's not that important. Foodstuffs here is the highest rate weighted in CPI. Almost 25 percent of the index is made up with foodstuffs, and that was an and had an annual inflation of 10.3. So the fact that that was fairly significant and above the target rate, we probably are going to have to notice that. So there's some information we're just looking at the data. Now here, so what did the government do in 2009? So this is the year before we get this information. It devalued the dong. The dong is the Vietnamese currency, so we've got devaluation against the US dollar by 10%. It raised the minimum wage in state patient, it raised minimum wage by 12%. It increases the minimum price, so we set minimum price for rice. And it encouraged banks to offer cheaper credit to increase lending. Then to limit inflation, we have price controls. This is quite important here. These affected state owned state owned enterprises. So the state still owned money, still owned some companies, sorry, not money. Uh, it affected foreign businesses and it also affected locally owned private firms. So it affected all types of companies. The controls applied to abnormal price changes on wide range of goods, including fertilizer, animal feeds, animal vaccines, cement, steel, liquid, petroleum, gas, coal, salt, milk, powder, rice and sugar. So kind of the government has tried to stop prices going too high. Right. That's quite, we've kind of told the story now in quite succinct terms. The data is quite useful. And we're going to have to refer back to the data throughout these questions. But let's have a look at, at question one. A. In question A, we've been asked with reference to the data. So this is going to be really important there, referencing the data. We've got to find two features of the command economy. So you're going to get one mark for each. You don't really need to say that much. Literally just identify. So what, what can we pick? Well, we can pick price controls. They're important. That's the kind of command economy. It's government controlling things. Government introducing price controls. That's one example. Say a minimum wage or minimum price, those are pretty um 
a, a, a pretty similar kind of um, things. We've got state owned enterprises here, state ownership of industries. Those are kind of the three big examples of um, the command economy elements within this article. We've got, got minimum wage or increased minimum price, and that includes pr price controls of increasing the minimum price. It's so similar, you probably you can't use them both. They're one of either increasing minimum price or price controls, minimum wage, and these state-owned businesses as well are also an example of a command economy. Cool. So that's quite a simple question. Uh, question B. Explain how the actions of the Vietnamese government in 2009 might have caused any two different types of inflation to occur in the Vietnamese economy. So, We've got to identify our two different types of inflation and explain how the Viet action, how amongst these actions, we got two different types of inflation. Okay. So the first one we're going to think about is the two, what are the two types of inflation? So in essence, the two types of inflation are cost push inflation, which is where, um, costs, uh, supply kind of costs of things are going up and therefore going to have to buy. The other one is being demand pull inflation. So demand goes up, capacity, the economy can't respond to demand. People are demanding more. And there's a shortage, so prices go up across the economy. Those are the two types. So what do we have that might suggest that there was cost push inflation? So we could say the devaluation is important. So what would the devaluation do? Well, devaluing the Vietnamese dong would um, result in kind of pushing up the prices of import. That's often referred to as imported cost push inflation. So by making imports more expensive, you're raising the price of goods in the economy. For example, if you're producing cars, let's say, and you're having to import steel, and the price of steel has gone up because you've devalued your currency, then the cars you're making are going to become more expensive and everything becomes more expensive. So that causes inflation there. Another one you could have said higher minimum wages. So if firms um, have higher production costs, firms have to pay their workers more if there's higher minimum wage. So they're going to increase their prices to compensate for that. So overall prices rise in the economy. So those are two kind of examples of uh, cost push inflation. On the other side of the coin, uh, demand pull inflation. Um, might have resulted from kind of a greater spending power associated with the higher minimum wages. So if you give people more money, higher minimum wages, then they're going to spend more. That's like they're demanding more. There's a shortage. Prices go up. Um, the banking policy as well maybe could have caused it. It's probably not the best. The other one is stronger. But the banking policy, by increasing lending, there's more money supply and therefore there's like monetary in inflation. So people have more money to spend. Uh, they're kind of getting more loans, etc., And therefore, people are demanding more. So anywhere where we're increasing aggregate demand in the economy here, so either giving people more money or increasing investment is going to increase offering cheaper credit and more lending. Those are going to create demand pull inflation. So in order to get the full marks here, it's really important that you identify both, you explain both those types of inflation, cost push and demand pull. And it's very important for you to be able to understand the differences between them and how both of them are caused. And understand that. And if you aren't sure on that, and I haven't been clear enough in explaining it, then please, please do ask ask on the on the Slack chat, on the Slack um, kind of message boards, and um, I'll get back to you with some explanation and set a time for us to talk. Okay. Question C. Question C is asking us to suggest two reasons why an inflation rate of 8.9% might not be a cause of concern to the government. So the reason here is we're saying that. It's got an annual rate rising to 8.9%, but the government's target rate was 8%. So you'd think that would be some concern. But why might it not be of concern? So it's, it, you could say, well, it might not be concerned because it's quite close to its target. 8.9% isn't that high above its target. It's only 0.9%. It's not 2% above target, etc. In England, for example, the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has to write a letter to the Chancellor if inflation is above, is 1% more than um, target. So target currently in the UK is 2%. Inflation last month was at 3 point, the last quarter was at 3.1%. Then because it's 1.1% above, he has to write a letter justifying why. So they might not be concerned if it's only 0.9% above target. We could say that maybe it's on a downward trend. That's another good point, is that we know that inflation was, it might be, if it was on a downward trend, they wouldn't be concerned. However, we can evaluate that point by saying, well, it's evidently not on a downtrend because in September 29, it experienced a sharp rise in inflation. So it's not generally downwards. You could say it's, it's lower than rivals. So around the, around the area, it's rival exporters are having similar levels of inflation or higher levels of inflation. So we might not be concerned. If, if this is only for a short period of time as well, we might not be concerned. So those are all kind of valid points. It's about just kind of understanding why you might not be concerned with the rate of inflation. 
Probably the biggest point is it's not that far away from target and using the data there is going to get you marked. You only really need to just suggest two quick reasons and explain why they might not be concerned about them. Time horizon is always a really good one to use in these kind of situations. So if it only exists for a short period of time, we're not really going to be concerned about that. Question D. So D has two parts. DI is for two marks and D2 is for DII is for four marks. So let's start with the first part. And the first part we're asking is to compare the contribution to the change of C in the CPI of the changes in the price of housing with that of education. So let's look at our CPI index. We've got housing, which went up 12.8%. In inflation and education, which ran at 15.6, which is the highest, but housing is worth almost double. So let's just look at the base. So housing went up by 12.8%. And because it has double digits here or 10% weighting, it's going to be cause a quite significant upward pressure. OK, you can say pretty upward pressure. The price of education rose by more here, we could say, but because of its lower weighting, it had less effect. So that's kind of what they're looking for you to say. There's kind of not really much. Uh, variation on how you can answer that question. You've just got to be able to say what I just said, basically. Part two of that question D, they're asking us to analyze two possible reasons for the government's selection of the items included for the price control. So here we've asked to um, kind of work out why the government might select certain items for price control. So what has it price controlled? Well, it's put price control on fertilizers, animal feeds, animal vaccines, cement, steel, liquid petroleum gas, coal, salt, milk, Powder, milk powder, rice and sugar. So why is it doing this? So let's let's have a look at some of the, the key ones to look at. So why might it do fertilizers and kind of like animal feeds and animal vaccines? Well, we can say agricultural supplies are really important there. So we want to increase output. We want to keep agricultural costs down. With animal feeds, we may talk about like kind of a similar point there that animal feeds and animal vaccines might be really important for kind of agricultural production. And that's where the country sees a lot of its growth coming from. So basically what you're wanting to do is kind of work out what these categories are of different products and why they might want to keep those lower priced than they normally would be. Cement, steel, liquid petroleum gas, coal, they're all kind of like industry, right? But the government's clearly trying to get those basic materials that all companies need to produce and manufacture things to be kind of kept under control in terms of prices so that those industries are somewhat protected. What else might we think about here? So we've got these kind of, um, Salt, milk, rice and sugar. Well, those are kind of consumer goods, foods, such necessities. They're basic foods. And that's maybe what poor families spend most of their money on. Maybe they're deemed to be kind of necessities. So you can justify that in terms of keeping those prices down so that people can afford to eat. So quality so that everyone can afford certain basic, basic items. Um, so then why are they kind of like selecting these? Well, you could say maybe they keep in touch with like, their macroeconomic objectives. So we want to bring down and keep control of inflation. So the things that people buy most and the most kind of important goods in the economy, the ones that would have this high, highest rated um, CPI, food stuff there, probably manufacturing is quite close to 20, 20 percent or something like that. Those you want to kind of weight quite highly and keep under control. So we might say that that's why they're, they're trying to reduce inflation. But we also they've kind of selected some of these key items quite like these highly weighted within the CPI in there. So okay, that's kind of like looking looking at that um, on question D. And question E is kind of asking us as a broader kind of point to discuss the policy of widespread price controls. So do we like price controls? So let's just think on, on both sides. So some of the arguments for, we might want to talk about the fact that price controls can help check the rate of inflation so they can help keep control of inflation, as we were talking about, by making sure the prices of key goods that has kind of probably bought the most in the economy are kept under control. And their price, those prices don't rise particularly high. Uh, we could also say that kind of they might help in redistributive ways. So we might keep um, prices low for certain essentials so that it's not just the rich who can afford, but also the poor who can afford to, to buy these items. So for equity or redistribution, we also say they might kind of work as a planning approach to economic management. So in terms of like kind of keeping the economy under control and economy and managing the country and the wealth, you could say that price controls are pretty effective for doing that. But what so when do these kinds of things work? When do price when are price controls desirable? Well, we don't really think that price controls are that strong in the long run. So we don't want to have price controls in place for ages because the market is much more efficient. But in the short run cases where people might get sick or there might be a real shortage or inflation might be really high, we need to make sure that um, we, we might need to make sure that um, 
we're kind of like managing these price controls and again, managing the price increases that would be caused by inflation. So then let's look at the arguments against. We only need one or two of each. But the problem that we don't like price controls is they might not tackle the underlying cause of inflation. They're kind of dealing with the surface. They're dealing with the price increases. But they're not realizing they're not tackling why we have inflation. So the pressure might build. So you can restrict prices as much, but the minute you take away your price controls, the prices are just going to skyrocket. So maybe it's because of um, you've got some kind of deficiency or a too low value currency or various different reasons why you might have long term inflation. Well, it's, well, it's kind of anti the market. It goes against the market and it's not economically efficient. That's based, a pretty basic argument with the government's intervening, setting a minimum price below the equilib- market equilibrium. Or kind of not letting the market allocate goods. So that's that's kind of a, a strong argument against there. Um, on the other side, um, similarly, we might want to talk about um, we might you you can say that you might need the problem with that it has is you need other it's desirable maybe and it works but only if you have other policies in place. So because you keep create price and um, price controls, you need to stop there being a black market. And we talked about this last paper. So a lot of the points are the same and you will have heard it already. But kind of you might need to have rationing, you might need to restrict black markets occurring, um, and you might need some government kind of intervention there. Um, and those are all the points you can kind of talk about price controls. It's worth kind of understanding that for and against things like price controls, quotas, um, price ceilings, um, so kind of minimum wages, maximum wages, um, ma- maximum prices, etc. It's worth kind of understanding the arguments and understanding both all three of those kinds of key types of policy there. And taxes as well would probably come under that tariffs and income taxes, etc. So that brings us to the end of part one. That's a slightly more theoretical part one than the other one, which was a little bit more technical. Uh, so kind of it's interesting to draw the, draw the comparisons between this paper and the one that was I recorded earlier today that uh, was Thursday's paper, because Thursday's paper is far more technical than this. It's more theoretical. But let's see how question two, section B comes out, because it might be that section one was weighted, section A, sorry, was weighted more towards being more theoretical, and section D has become a lot more technical because of that. So let's have a look, a look at some of these questions and we'll run through them. And again, if you have written these essays and have any more questions on them and things like that, uh, then do um, get in touch uh, about that. Question 2A. So candidates, um, sorry, explain using a diagram how the social cost of consuming some goods can exceed the private cost. So what's really important here is to really understand um, what we mean by private costs and social costs. So what do we mean here? So what you, what's really important here is not to be confused about the term. So what is a social, what is social cost? The social cost is private costs and externalities. Okay. That could be positive. It could be negative externalities. Right. So once we get that, what are private costs? Private costs are just costs that occur in the exchange. So what do we want? Well, why is there going to be a difference between them? So the social cost of consuming some goods exceed the private cost when there are negative ex- when there are external- negative externalities involved, right? So a negative externality is the difference between the private cost and the social cost. So once we've understood that and defined it, we want to show how that occurs on the diagram. So our diagram is going to be for half the market. So what do we, what do we need to show on our diagram? Well, we need to show our private marginal cost curve. Uh, we need to show our social marginal cost curve. And then we want to show our social marginal benefit curve and we want to label all the axes and showing the divergence uh, in place here between private costs and social costs. So showing how they move apart as you consume more. So it's worth knowing those diagrams are kind of really understanding. the Right. Question B. Question B here is asking us to discuss using examples whether cost benefit analysis is an effective way of decision making when allocating an economy's resources. So. This, in this course, it's important that you're aware of kind of what cost benefit analysis is. So I'll just give a quick run through, and it's worth reading about this more in your notes. So, cost benefit analysis is essentially a way that governments generally would imagine, but businesses do make decisions. So how do they do that? Well, they weigh up the costs of, the, of doing something and the benefits of doing something, and essentially they'll do something if the benefits outweigh the costs. So now, if, if so, how would you do that if you're um, what's the process you do? Well, you basically have to assess before you've even done something where the costs and where the benefits would be. Who would benefit? Who would um, lose out? Whether there's external costs, because we need to take into account everything. And then we'll make a decision. 
So what are some of the so what so how can it be used? So let's think of an example. An example I always like to use is let's think of a road being built or a bridge. So you think, well, who who who's going to benefit from this? Well, maybe it's the companies on either side of the bridge, right? Maybe they're specifically going to benefit from this. Who else might benefit? Well, you could say maybe there's some external benefits, like the town, the people who might use the bridge to get to work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So loads of different examples there. What are the costs? So the cost might be simply the cost of building the bridge, right? You've got to pay for the tools, you've got to pay for the equipment, you've got to pay for the people to build it. That's the private cost. What's the social cost? So now you've got to think about, well, there's noise pollution from during the building process. There's costs to people who might get more traffic coming past them. There might be people who live near the bridge who don't really want it to be there and might say, oh, it's going to create more noise, etc. So those are all external costs that we have to take into account. And so that's using an example here with good illustration of how kind of cost benefit analysis is going to be used. So highlighting all the different costs. It doesn't need to be too long. Making sure you're quite comprehensive is really going to be a way of getting the marks here. And you can only actually on this question get a maximum of six marks if you don't give any examples. Having kind of shown how you would do a cost benefit analysis, we kind of want to think about why, whether cost benefit analysis is an effective way of decision making when allocating resources. So, and this is the conclusion, so you've got to come to a decision here. So personally, I would argue that cost benefit analysis is quite an effective way, especially when you want to consider the wide ranging effects that a project might have. And it gives you a very clear means of deciding. Why might people, some people say that cost benefit analysis isn't so good? Well, some people may say that cost benefit analysis is very difficult to do properly. It's got a lot of methodological problems. For example, you can't always know what the cost will be or the full impact of a project will be. Sometimes when you're building something, you can't really take in, there are kind of unknown costs that may crop up that you can't take into account. And so it's quite difficult to do an accurate cost benefit analysis. And often we see that cost benefit analysis, analyses show more um, more benefits than they do costs and things get built that we don't like. Other times you can say the cost benefit analysis may be too stringent. We don't simply want to say oh, after this has more costs than it does benefits, then we don't want to do it because we might say that the benefits here are actually so important as benefits, although they might be small, that um, or so essential, such essential benefits that any some cost is worth kind of like having so that um, the project still goes under, under, under is still undertaken and the allocation is still achieved. So kind of there's some kind of thoughts around cost benefit analysis. And it's worth having a think about some of these kinds of methods for economic decision making so that when they do, if they and when they do come up in the exams, you're able to kind of answer the questions on them. Right, moving on to question three. This is an intro, a really actually intro, like a pretty interesting question when I saw it. So here we have a firm that's producing yogurt. Interesting. And it's given the following information about the price elasticity of demand of various flavors. So we know that strawberry has this kind of elasticity of minus 0.8, so of less than one. Vanilla has kind of unitary price elasticity there of one. And pineapple has a elasticity of um, minus 2.5. So what we want to do is we want to explain the pricing policy that the firm should adopt for each of the flavors if it wants to increase total revenue. So we know that it wants to increase total revenue. What do we know about the elasticity of different uh, prices? So here we need to probably start by defining piece of price elasticity of demand and then we want to apply it. So price elasticity of demand suggests, explains to you the changes in price given changes in quantity, uh, given a uh, change in quantity given changes in price. Sorry. So if we increase the, the price of strawberry by 1%, essentially, we're going to get a minus 0.8% all in demand. What does that tell us? So it tells us we'd still make more revenue by increasing the price of strawberry. So we want to increase the price of strawberry. That's how you'd maximize revenue. Well, vanilla, you can just leave it the same. We don't want to change it, right? Because increasing it by 1% is just going to leave our, it's not going to help us. It's simply just going to leave our revenue the same. What do we want to do with pineapple? Well, pineapple, we actually want to reduce the price because by reducing the price, we're going to massively boost demand by 2.5%, by 2.5% more. 2.5% more. And uh, because of that, we're going to um, see total revenue increase. So not understanding the concept of price elasticity is going to be the first part. And that's actually going to get you two marks just by kind of finding price elasticity of demand. Let me give the equation there and then applying it to, the, to, to, the, to, to each of the flavors and understanding why it's going to increase revenue and give an explanation of that, essentially by saying that if you increase price in a certain direction or decrease price separate, you'll increase demand more or less 
and therefore you're going to kind of boost total revenue in the long in 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 each case. Um, so that's actually not that difficult a question, but it's quite an interesting one and quite a new question that I haven't seen come up before. Right, question B. So question B is asking us to explain the factors that will lead to an increase in demand for all types of yogurt and discuss the extent to which the firm influenced these factors. So why might yogurt increase overall? So what we want to think about is kind of the factors of demand and apply these in the in this case. So we want to think about how the firm can can also affect uh, kind of affects. So that's kind of the second part. So the first part. What factors lead to an increase? So one is incomes, right? So if people get richer, we can say they buy more yogurt. Maybe we can also say um, the type, the, the kind of taste, individuals' taste. Maybe individuals are starting to like um, yogurt more than they like alternatives. Like what's gonna, what might an alternative be? So simple taste. It's going to increase demand. So maybe people are going off uh, chocolate mousse desserts and want yogurt. Maybe people have gone off milk and want yogurt instead of their cereal. I don't know. Different things. So people's tastes have shifted. Maybe the price, right? So it's complementary goods. Uh, sorry, um, substitute goods. So the if price of substitute prices, maybe substitute for yogurt is um, milk. So if the price of milk goes up, maybe the price of yogurt is not, not, is not increasing by as much. So people are going to shift their demand for milk to yogurt. Maybe it's other desserts prices gone up. Maybe you could say, well, it's compliments. So maybe there's a compliment to yogurt, muesli or um, other types of kind of like food that you might eat with yogurt. I don't know. The complementary goods might be um, reduced in price and that will increase the price by yogurt. So how can those, these are kind of four factors. I'll just quickly recap them. So income, uh, we talked about taste, consumer tastes and consumer kind of preferences. Um, price of substitutes and price of compliments. So can the firm affect any of these? Let's have a think. So this is the second part, the discussion part, after having identified those factors. So how can the firm, can the firm in influence incomes? Well, no, it can't. So incomes are outside the control of the firm. So you would say, well, the firm can't influence those. What about consumer taste? Can the firm influence those? Well, maybe the firm can. It can use advertising, for example. Um, and if the firm advertises its yogurt, if firms advertise yogurts effectively, then maybe consumers are going to start buying more of them. Uh, in terms of the price of substitutes, uh, probably not, unless the firm itself decides to raise the price of the substitutes, if it supplies substitutes itself to be able to um, drive sales of yogurt. Uh, but it's probably unlikely to do that, you could say. And on the other side, on compliment side, it's a kind of similar point, but maybe a little bit more effective is that if the firm is really trying to push yogurt, it might, and it sells compliments like muesli or something, it might reduce the price of its muesli to try and get people to then buy more yogurt. So those are kind of some some arguments you can make there. And finally here uh, for this paper, looking at question four, here we're asked to use a diagram to explain how a fall in the rate of interest in a country can cause its foreign exchange rate to change. So here we're looking at interest. So what, what causes foreign exchange rates to change? Well, about supply uh, uh, supply and demand of its currency, right? So how would a change in interest, a fall in the rate of interest in a country, so a fall in the interest rate, cause its foreign exchange rate to change? Well, people will, um, it causes like an outflow of capital. So you'll have kind of more capital being sold abroad. People aren't investing as much in the country. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to cause an excess supply of your foreign currency in the markets. Okay, so you're going to have more of your currency on international markets. People aren't going to be investing as much in your country. They're not going to be, well, one, they're not going to be demanding as much of your currency because demand for it has gone down. People aren't looking to get pounds so that you can then put it in a UK bank and get interest on it. And also that you've got capital flowing out. So people are kind of exporting more. So there's kind of more supply of your currency on the um, international markets. Um, so increasing supply and decreasing demand creates uh, an excess. And as such, you're going to get a fall in or depreciation of the interest rate. So it's kind of all the the shift in the supply curve to the right or the fall of interest rates reducing the rate of demand. So you could do it on the diagram and you'll show the kind of decline. So you're, the way to really get marks here is using a clear and like accurate diagram as it's being asked to do, uh, showing the supply and demand of your currency, uh, shifting that. And you're going to get four marks for your diagram and four marks for the um explanation that an outflow of capital and a reduced demand for your currency kind of as the UK currency becomes less of a store of um, kind of an, uh, an investment because it's not because it doesn't have as much interest um, causes 
these shifts to occur? Quite a simple question there. Question B is a little bit harder. Here we're asked whether to discuss whether a rise in its exchange rate or a fall in its exchange rate is more beneficial for an economy. So we basically need to have an understanding of the effects of both depreciation and appreciation of a currency on an economy. And both have disadvantages in, and advantages. And it's really important here that you have a grasp of both to gain a high mark. So why, what, what are some of the answers we might give here? Well, one we want to talk about, obviously, I'm just going to give you some ideas of things you want to talk about rather than going through each point, because each point works both. One, you want to talk about imports and exports. So what's going to happen to imports? So when imports become cheaper, um, it's a bit and it's kind of you can say, well, there's a higher quality of life, maybe for your citizens. They can afford to buy more goods from abroad. You can buy Japanese cars, American food, etc. All these different things. So you've got more choice and a better quality of life because you get cheaper goods from abroad. Whereas if imports are kind of cheap, though, maybe you get you, your domestic industry is going to die out and you're going to be threatened by cheaper goods from abroad. Why might imports becoming more expensive, though, be a problem? Well, principally because imports being expensive is imported inflation. So if you're having to import necessities because you can't produce certain things in your economy, then you're going to get cost push, in, uh, uh, cost push inflation, imported inflation there. So that's probably that, that's really the counterpoint there. And obviously, increased prices added to the quality of life of your citizens. Uh, why might increased uh, cost of imports be good? Well, domestic industries might like it um, because they are able to. Um, to kind of like supply their goods, supply the economy more and you'll get more growth in domestic industry, which is good because you're not sending money out the economy. Remember, imports are a negative on the on the kind of growth in a country. It's a leakage from the economy. AD equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So we don't want M to be too imports, M to be too high there. Let's look at now, you'd kind of want to consider both sides. So we'd probably want to talk about kind of what would happen when we get the rise or fall in exchange rate to exports. Well, why might an increase in exports when the exchange rate falls be, be good for you? Well, um, exports are uh, increased exports good because it's a positive, it's growth. Uh, we really want UK or your countries and um, your economies uh, exporters to be making money and you can pump that back into investment, become more high tech, pump it into R&D, pay your workers more. Kind of so it's kind of good to have strong exports. Um, why might we like exports becoming more expensive? And why, why am I? Well, we don't really like exports coming more expensive. There isn't really a good reason because our exporters are pretty important for an economy. Unless we're exporting things elsewhere rather than selling them because you can get more money abroad. Uh, but that's not really the strongest argument. Let me just explain that point there at the end. I kind of rushed through it. So the point about exporting when exports become more expensive, um, or if exporters might want to sell more if there's still demand depends on the elasticity of demand for your exports. If they are able to sell it, for more money and still have as much demand on the international markets, then they might choose to sell more out there. And then what's going to happen is you're not going to have enough at home. So domestic consumption shifting because the exports is not great and you might want some of the, the goods to remain in the economy. So you can see that you can argue both sides. So where do you need to get the marks here? Well, what you need to do is you need to at some point decide on a side. So one, you have to do both. You have to do appreciation and depreciation here because you could only get six marks if only one is done. You also need to, you can only get three marks maximum for the whole economy if you don't, for the whole question, if you don't make a conclusion, right? Uh, for, for your evaluation, sorry. So you have to make an evaluative comment on which one is more beneficial and a conclusion. So you have to kind of answer this question. When it says discuss, you have to come to a conclusion there. So remember that. That brings us to the end of the paper. Uh, quite a tricky one, a little bit more theoretical. So I'm sure you'll have some questions there and a reminder to kind of send those to me and get them in the Slack. Um, Slack um, kind of message boards so that we can answer those questions. Uh, as I said, the multiple choice coming as soon as I can get it done. Uh, thank you so much for your patience this week. It's really appreciated. And um, I promise next week that we'll be in a much kind of stronger position to get them all done on time. Thank you, guys.